Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. There was no mistake. The leathery wings, the little horns, the barbed tail, all were there. The most terrible of legends had come to life out of the unknown past. Yet it now stood smiling in ebon majesty with the sunlight gleaming upon its tremendous body and with a human child resting trustfully on either arm. Childhood's End, Arthur C. Clarke, 1953. In this episode of The Haunted Chair, it seems that for many months now, the world has been excited by the potential of reported sightings of UFOs across the globe. The Pentagon is investigating a rising number of cases involving unidentified aircraft, now tracking an estimated 650 incidents. These potential visitations are certainly not a new phenomenon, but are they indeed visitors from another world? Could they simply be sightings of advanced government aircraft that various departments wish to keep hush-hush? Could they, in many cases, be something as simple as a Chinese weather balloon? Could they be a hallucination of minds that are predisposed toward belief? Or perhaps something else entirely? And why do a majority of cases seem to imply something malevolent at work, with sinister sightings of men in black? as well as cryptids such as the Mothman appearing in close proximity. We will examine the subject of alien visitation in depth and look into a possible link to other sightings of the supernatural throughout history. Greetings, friends. It's been far too long. I know the weather is ghastly and the roads are treacherous, but I'm so glad you could join us this evening. Have a drink. Warm yourself by the fire. Let's discuss real and genuine tales of terror. The strange and bizarre, myths and legends, haunted histories and ghost sightings, cursed objects, cryptids and UFO abductions, secret societies, the occult, and dark conspiracy. Let's discuss all of these things. But first, please have a seat in the haunted chair. suggest that humans have long witnessed unexplainable events in the sky, formal documentation of such phenomena did not begin until Roman times. The first written mention of unidentified flying objects may have been in 218 before Common Era, when the historian Livy wrote in detail about phantom ships seen gleaming in the sky. Then in 76 Common Era, Gaius Plinius Secundus or Pliny the Elder, wrote about his own encounter with what may have been a UFO, but was more likely a meteor. In chapter 35 of his work, Naturalis Historia, he described a spark falling from a star and increasing as it approached the earth until it became the size of the moon, shining as though through a cloud. It afterwards returned into the heavens. Two years later, in 74 before Common Era, Plutarch of Cheronea wrote of an aerial mystery during a battle between the armies of Lucullus and Mithridates VI in Asia. He wrote of a huge and seemingly a light object in the sky between the armies that was wine vessel shaped and silver in color. However, his detractors may have suggested that he was simply looking intently 
at a wine vessel he was enjoying, hence the wild story. Several Roman writers and historians have written extensively about encounters that closely resemble modern-day UFO sightings. Livy, Pliny, Plutarch, Paulus Orosius, Seneca the Elder, and Flavius Josephus are among those who have documented sightings of strange objects in the sky. However, the reliability of these reports is questionable because many Roman writers would mix fact and metaphor, blurring the line between truth and fiction. This is a common issue with historical writing, making it difficult to discern where reality ends and imagination begins. by Massachusetts Bay Colony co-founder and governor John Winthrop in 1639, possibly documents the first UFO sighting in America. Winthrop detailed that a sober, discreet man named James Everall was rowing his boat up the muddy river at night when he came upon a great light in the sky. He reported that when it stood still, it flamed up and was about three yards square. When it ran, it was contracted into the figure of a swine. It ran as swift as an arrow towards Charleston, and so up and down about two or three hours. When the lights had vanished, Everall and his companions had traveled one mile upstream with significant missing time. Cynthia Everett, a 24-year-old Massachusetts woman employed as a schoolteacher in Camden, Maine in 1808, made a diary entry of a similar account. On July 22nd, her diary is as follows. About 10 o'clock I saw a very strange appearance. It was a light which proceeded from the east. At the first sight I thought it was a meteor, but from its motion I soon perceived it was not. It seemed to dart at first quickly as light and appeared to be in the atmosphere, but lowered toward the ground and kept on at an equal distance, sometimes ascending and sometimes descending. In 1961, during the Cold War, the U.S. Air Force operated a radar base on Vermont's East Mountain named the North Concord Air Force Station. This station consisted of a Quonset hut village with a store, bowling alley, and theater, and housed around 175 men. According to military reports, a strange object appeared in the skies above the outpost and remained visible for around 18 minutes. The base closed in 1963 and now sits abandoned. However, some have linked this appearance to one of the most famous abduction reports ever recorded. On the night of September 19, 1961, Betty and Barney Hill, a Portsmouth, New Hampshire couple, claimed to have been taken by extraterrestrials near Franconia Notch. The Hills witnessed a bright light in the sky while driving home around 10.30 p.m., and Betty thought at first it was a shooting star before it changed direction and moved upward. Upon stopping the car for a closer look, they saw through binoculars a strange, shaped craft flashing multicolored lights. As they attempted to drive away, the 40-foot-long craft followed them, eventually descending so low over their 1957 Chevy that it caused them to stop the car. Barney observed humanoid figures in black uniforms through the ship's windows, at which point the hills drove away at high speed. Subsequently, they heard buzzing and beeping sounds, along with a tingling sensation, and then they both blacked out. Upon regaining consciousness, they had traveled almost 35 miles south, although they didn't remember the journey. However, later, under hypnosis, the hills detailed being taken on the ship where they were separated and examined. An adaptation of their story was penned by journalist John D. Fuller 
into the best-selling 1966 book titled The Interrupted Journey and the 1975 television movie The UFO Incident. The Hills were an ordinary couple until they had the encounter with the UFO. At the time of their experience in 1961, their marriage was not legally recognized as Barney, a black man, and Betty, a white woman, were not allowed to marry in the United States due to the anti-miscegenation laws, which later were repealed by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1967. Both Barney and Betty were active members of the NAACP and important members of their local community. Barney worked at the United States Postal Service while Betty was a social worker. They even served on a local board of the United States Commission on Civil Rights. The Hills were not considered to be eccentric or conspiracy theorists. They were just an average couple trying to live a happy life. However, everything changed on the night of September 19, 1961. At approximately 10.30 p.m., the Hills were driving from Niagara Falls to Portsmouth when Betty spotted something unusual in the sky south of Lancaster, New Hampshire. She observed a bright light move from below the moon to a spot in the sky near Jupiter. Initially mistaking it for a shooting star, the couple pulled over to take a closer look when the light began moving upwards. Barney brought their car to a stop at a scenic picnic area south of Twin Mountain, and using binoculars, they spotted a peculiar object with flashing, multicolored lights moving in front of the moon. Betty realized that they were witnessing a UFO. At first, Barney was doubtful that they were actually seeing an unidentified flying object. He believed they were observing a commercial airliner en route to Montreal. However, his skepticism faded when he saw the object alter its course and rapidly descend. The couple then entered their vehicle and headed toward Franconia Notch, a road that winds through narrow, mountainous terrain, assuming that their encounter with the UFO was concluded for the night. The intense activity overwhelmed the hills, prompting them to resume their journey. However, when they reached a point approximately one mile south of Indian Head, the object suddenly descended toward their 1957 Chevrolet Bel Air, compelling them to halt their vehicle in the middle of the road. According to the couple, the colossal craft levitated roughly 100 feet above their car. Rather than speed away, Barney alighted from the vehicle, armed with a pistol, to obtain a better view. He claimed that he saw between 8 to 11 humanoid figures observing him through the craft's windows from his position on the road. It was at this point that Barney asserted that one of the humanoids communicated with him telepathically, instructing him to remain where you are and keep looking. Subsequently, red lights began flashing on the bat wing fins of the flying object, followed by a telescope emerging from the side of the craft and a structure descending from the ship's bottom. As the sun rose, the couple arrived home, unable to recollect the entirety of the previous night's events, yet sensing that something was amiss. Betty requested that their luggage be left close to the back door, while Barney felt compelled to check himself over. Both took lengthy showers before sketching images of the strange phenomenon they had witnessed. After getting a few hours rest, Betty awoke and stowed away the clothing she had donned during the drive in her closet. Upon examination, she discovered that her dress had rips in the fabric, as well as a torn zipper and hemline. She subsequently discarded the garment, but later retrieved it from the trash, intending to have it scrutinized. The Hills inspected the trunk and detected gleaming, concentric rings that had not been present the day before. Using a compass, the couple positioned it near the marks on the vehicle, and the instrument began to behave erratically. It was evident that something was askew, but what could it be? On September 21st, two days after the incident, Betty contacted the Pease Air Force Base to report her encounter, 
but she intentionally left out some details to avoid being viewed as eccentric. The following day, Major Paul W. Henderson contacted the Hills with additional inquiries, and in his report, he suggested that the couple had merely witnessed Jupiter. However, the report was later amended to state optical conditions and then insufficient data. Several days following their sighting of the UFO, Betty headed to the local library and came across a book by retired Marine Corp Major Donald E. Kehoe, who was the head of the civilian UFO research group NICAP, the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena. On September 2nd, Hill contacted Kehoe to share their entire story, including specifics about the humanoids they observed inside the craft. In her letter, she mentioned that she and her husband were considering hypnosis to uncover the truth of what had happened. The letter was forwarded by Kehoe to Walter Webb, an ICAP investigator who conducted a six-hour interview with the Hills on October 21st, 1961. During the interview, Barney revealed that there was a mental block that prevented him from remembering certain details of the encounter with the craft. He suspected that there was something about the incident that he couldn't recall. Webb was quoted as saying, They were telling the truth, and the incident probably occurred exactly as reported, except for some minor uncertainties and technicalities that must be tolerated in any such observations where human judgment is involved. For instance, exact time and length of visibility, apparent sizes of objects and occupants, distance and height of object, etc. Approximately one week following their supposed UFO incident, Betty had a sequence of vivid dreams that persisted for five consecutive nights. After the fifth night, the dreams abruptly ceased. Betty shared the occurrences with Barney, but he didn't seem to be bothered, so she kept her concerns to herself. In November, Betty documented the details of her dreams, which included one in which their car was surrounded by men, and she passed out while Barney struggled to take control of the vehicle. Betty had another dream where the men surrounding them were clearly visible. They were approximately five feet and four inches tall and wore blue uniforms and hats, making them appear like a military group. The humanoids had black hair, dark eyes, blue lips, and noses that protruded. They had gray skin and had the ability to make both her and Barney sleepwalk to their craft. Betty recalls the hills being guided up a ramp and into a metallic disc-shaped craft by the same humanoids who observed them from the windows earlier. Once inside, they were separated for ease of examination. Betty describes the humanoid who examined her as calm and pleasant and claimed that he was trying to identify any differences between her and the crew. The examination included checking her extremities, cutting off a piece of her hair, trimming her fingernails, and inserting a needle into her navel. When Betty cried out in pain, the examiner waved his hand over her face, and the pain subsided. After the examination, the examiner left the room, and Betty conversed with the leader. She observed rows of strange symbols in a book, and the leader allowed her to take it with her. Betty also asked where they were from, and the leader showed her a map marked with stars. The leader was forthcoming about their space travel and offered Betty some trinkets from the ship. When Betty asked where they came from, the leader retrieved an instructional map with stars that indicated his home planet. Upon completing their visit, a group of humanoids escorted the hills out of the ship, but they began to argue over the book that Betty wanted to take with her. Despite being reprimanded for wanting to take a souvenir from her abduction, Betty insisted that she would remember the events no matter what occurred. When the hills were brought back to their car, the leader recommended that they observe the craft's departure before resuming their trip home. During the November 25, 1961 interview with NICAP, the hills were questioned about the duration of their trip aboard the craft, and their drive from Niagara should have only taken four hours, yet they arrived home seven hours after leaving Colebrook, New Hampshire. 
The couple couldn't prove a satisfactory explanation for this inconsistency, which added weight to the possibility of an abduction. While they couldn't account for their missing time along US Route 3 between Indian Head and Ashland, they did recall seeing a fiery orb. They initially assumed it was the moon, but were perplexed to discover that the moon had already set before their time on Route 3. It was then that they considered hypnosis as a way to help Betty understand the meaning of her dreams, which Barney was also interested in. The Hills remained silent about their alleged abduction until the spring of 1963, when they confided in members of their church. In September of that year, the couple discussed the possibility of undergoing formal hypnosis with Captain Ben H. Sweat of the United States Air Force, who was a guest speaker at their church. Sweat referred them to Benjamin Simon, a hypnotist based in Boston. During their first meeting with Simon on December 14, 1963, he noticed that Barney was much more anxious about the experience than he'd let on. While Simon was skeptical about the UFO story, he believed that the Hills truly believed that their encounter was real. Barney and Betty underwent hypnotic regression from January 4, 1964 to June 6, 1964, in which Barney remembered seeing humanoid figures and feeling genuine fear about what was going to happen to him. He recalled keeping his eyes closed for most of the examination so he couldn't be certain about what he was seeing. In a separate session, Barney revealed that after returning to his car, he had an uncontrollable urge to drive into the woods. He stopped abruptly when he saw six humanoid figures near a dirt road. Three of the humanoids approached the car and told Barney not to be afraid, but he still felt anxious. Barney reported, I felt like the eyes had pushed into my eyes. After being hypnotized, Betty's recollection of the abduction story closely matched her recurring dream, with specific distances of the events and new details about the humanoids. Interestingly, both Betty and Barney had similar memories induced by hypnosis. During one emotionally charged session, Simon suggested that Betty draw the star map that she saw during the abduction, in which she described a 3D projection. Betty's drawing consisted of 12 major stars connected by three lines and three smaller stars that formed a clear triangle. She claimed that the stars represented trade routes. The sketch was reminiscent of a bee movie. Despite their differing beliefs about the veracity of the Hill's abduction story, Simon never fully accepted their account of the events. He maintained that Barney's recollections of the encounter were most likely influenced by Benny's dreams, despite Barney's disagreement. However, despite their disagreements, the Hills appreciated Simon's hypnosis treatment, which helped to alleviate much of the anxiety they had experienced since their encounter. After completing their hypnosis session with Simon, the Hills returned to their regular lives and didn't actively seek out publicity for their alleged abduction although they were open about it if they were asked. It wasn't until October 25, 1965, when the Boston Traveler published the story, UFO Chiller, Did They Seize Couple, by John H. Luttrell, that the couple gained international attention. Luttrell had heard an audio recording of a talk the couple gave in 1963. In 1965, John G. Fuller published The Interrupted Journey, a book about the case that was written with the cooperation of the Hills and Simon. The book included Simon's findings as well as Betty's star map. Sadly, three years later, on February 25, 1969, Barney passed away from a cerebral hemorrhage at the age of 46. Betty never remarried and continued to tell her story whenever she was asked. She passed away on October 17, 2004, at the age of 85. Whitley Strieber has been a controversial figure in the realm of paranormal research. 
best known as the author of the popular book Communion. According to Strieber, he was taken by extraterrestrial beings in 1985, an event that has had a lasting impact on his life. While his claims have been the subject of much debate, with some considering them a fabrication and others citing them as evidence of intelligent life beyond our planet, they have undoubtedly had an influence on popular culture and our ongoing search for understanding the universe. Strieber was born in San Antonio, Texas in 1945, and after graduating from Central Catholic High in his hometown, he went on to receive degrees from the University of Texas at Austin and the London School of Film Technique in 1968. He then built a successful career in advertising in New York City, rising to the position of vice president before leaving the industry in 1977 to pursue his passion for writing. Strieber first made a name for himself in the horror genre with his novels The Wolfen and The Hunger, both of which were later adapted into successful films. Whitley Strieber's assertions of being kidnapped by non-human beings have fascinated and divided audiences for years. According to his testimony, in the evening of December 26, 1985, extraterrestrial entities took him from his cabin in upstate New York. On that fateful night, Strieber, then 40 years old, woke up to find himself being carried into the woods near his home. He claims to have been subjected to a savage attack by unknown assailants, including enormous insects and hideous troll-like figures. One of the onlookers was also an old friend of Strieber's who he later learned had died several months earlier. Strieber's incredible narrative of alien abduction continues to inspire and intrigue, posing profound questions about the nature of reality and our position in the universe. According to Strieber, he was awoken in the middle of the night by a peculiar sound and glimpsed a tiny, non-human entity approaching his bed. The next thing he knew, it was morning, and he felt bewildered and uncharacteristically hostile. Many months later, while undergoing regressive hypnosis, Strieber began to collect some of the events from that crucial night. He alleges that beings he called the visitors abducted him entering his home and taking him without his consent. As per Strieber's testimony, the event involved the manifestation of enigmatic creatures standing at 3.5 feet tall with their faces concealed by hoods and hats. These entities, who Strieber later dubbed the visitors, took him from his bedroom to a filthy chamber where he was subjected to a sequence of troubling experiments. In this poor-lit auditorium-like era, he was surrounded by sturdy, fair-skinned beings clad in overalls that emanated an intense aroma of cinnamon and cardboard. Strieber contends that he was then exposed to a surreal and petrifying ordeal where a silver needle was implanted into his head, leaving him with more uncertainties than clarifications regarding the nature of his encounters. In the early hours of December 26, Strieber was awakened by a commotion of whooshing and whirling noises emanating from the living area of his cabin, accompanied by the sound of a group of individuals hastily moving around the room. Instead of seeking assistance, Strieber opted to lie back down and endeavor to fall asleep again. It wasn't until he spotted a presence or something observing him from behind his bedroom door that he realized the situation's gravity. He gazed intently, attempting to discern the figure, and that's when it dashed toward him as he sat upright, anticipating the worst in the dimly lit chamber. Strieber's account continues, and the entities he encountered were diminutive in stature, standing about three and a half feet tall, making them smaller than his own offspring. One of the beings was adorned with a curious, sleek hat featuring a pointed brim that extended four inches on the side, obscuring its face. Another figure was observed donning a square panel etched with concentric circles, spanning from just under the chin to the waist. At first, Strieber thought it was a form of body armor, but on closer inspection, 
he discerned a rectangular device of the same kind covering the lower abdomen to just above the knees. Despite the puzzlement of many, Strieber did not initially take any action against these enigmatic visitors, leading some to question his response. In his book Communion, Strieber acknowledged that he initially believed he was either having an intense dream or was under some kind of hypnotic trance. Nonetheless, the issue persists. Was Strieber truly incapable of acting against his otherworldly intruders? He wrote, in any case, I sat there frightened, but unable or unwilling to deal with what I was observing. My mind explained my vision to me. Despite my wakefulness, it must be a hypnopompic hallucination. Such phenomena sometimes occurs as one drifts between waking and sleep. I assume that some minor disturbance had awakened me and I was experiencing such an illusion. And never mind the fact that I felt fully awake. Following his encounter with the three enigmatic beings, Strieber's journey had just begun. He recounted that he had no recollection of falling asleep or communicating with these creatures. Instead, he found himself inexplicably frozen in mid-motion, devoid of any clothing. He further states, I was moving out of the room. There was no physical sensation at all, not of being touched, not of being warm or cold. I could feel myself as a shape and a mass, but not in terms of sensation. It was as if I had become profoundly paralyzed. Although I wanted desperately to move, I could not. According to Strieber's recollection, he found himself sitting in the woods after being lifted out of his cabin. Two creatures were present, but just out of his field of vision. He was then raised above the trees and transported into a cluttered, circular space. Despite being reduced to a helpless human with little sense of who or where he was, Strieber still managed to recall some details about the craft where he was allegedly taken. The room in which he found himself was circular and had a gray tan color scheme with a domed ceiling. The air was stuffy and the room was cluttered with small humanoid figures moving about at a dizzying pace. Other than a bench on which he was placed, Strieber could not recall many other features of the room. Strieber's account continues and the most horrifying aspect of his abduction was the visitor's actions once they brought him aboard their ship. He recalls screaming uncontrollably as they inserted a thin, shiny needle mounted on a black surface into his head with a loud bang and a bright flash. After the procedure, he found himself lying on a table surrounded by huddled figures who were all fixated on him. Strieber has little memory of what happened after the needle was inserted but he does recall feeling utterly helpless against the creatures. Strieber observed that the beings surrounded him during his encounter were diverse in appearance. Alongside the familiar big-eyed, slit-mouthed aliens depicted in popular culture, there were also small, robot-like entities and short, stocky beings donning dark blue coveralls. These stocky visitors had broad faces with glittering, deep-set eyes stumpy noses, and wide human-like mouths. Strieber went on to describe non-humanoid creatures around five feet in height, possessing delicate features with nearly vestigial noses and mouths. Additionally, there were smaller creatures with large, button-like eyes. Although he couldn't discern the purpose of their collective presence, Strieber observed that the stocky visitors were responsible for transporting him to various locations. Upon Strieber's return to his cabin by one of the mysterious beings, he was confronted with terrifying visions of the world's destruction. Despite resisting the creature's psychic powers, the experience only became more intense and alarming. The beings purportedly told him he was the chosen one when he asked them why he was undergoing such horrors. These surreal and enigmatic events continued to fuel discussion and conjecture among those who strive to comprehend the genuine essence of Strieber's encounters. 
One of the most intrusive aspects of many alien abduction accounts is the assertion that extraterrestrial beings probe their abductees, and Strieber's account is no exception. After the traumatic experience of the needle in his brain, he recounts being subjected to a probe which he believes was conducted to obtain tissue samples. Despite the motive behind it, he describes feeling angry towards his alien captors during this ordeal. After the invasive procedure, a creature made a cut on his index finger, and the next thing he recalls is waking up in his bed the next morning. Upon awakening on December 27th, Struber felt extremely disoriented. He recalls seeing an owl perched on his roof, but now believes that this was his mind's attempt to process the strange beings he had encountered. When he asked his wife if she had seen the owl, she replied that she had not, and there were no signs of any owl tracks on the roof of the cabin. Again, according to Strieber, in the days after his abduction, he felt completely exhausted, feverish, and emotionally volatile. He recalls that when his neighbors came to visit, he found himself inexplicably lashing out at them without provocation. He writes, no sooner had we started talking than I found myself complaining that I thought I had seen the light of a snowmobile in the woods between our houses at about three in the morning. I was horrified at myself. What was I saying? I couldn't remember any such thing, and I knew it even as I spoke. After some small talk, our neighbors went home. I was not pleased with my own behavior and found it hard to understand because it seems so non-volitional, almost as if I had been talking against my will. Again, according to Strieber, he only became aware of local reports of strange sightings in the sky over Middleton, New York, in January of 1986. In an article in the local paper, The Record, one man claimed to have seen multiple objects flying over a brightly lit state prison, while another saw several planes. Another piece of evidence came from Strieber's 18-year-old neighbor who reported seeing something hovering over a road about five miles from Strieber's cabin on the night of his abduction. Although the neighbor did not refer to it as a UFO, he described it as an unknown solid structure that remained in the area for almost 15 minutes, lending credibility to Strieber's account. Strieber was initially unwilling to believe that he had been abducted and experimented on by extraterrestrial beings. He searched for any other explanation, but after speaking with other people who claimed to have been abducted, he began to consider the possibility that he had been taken by aliens. He first spoke with a woman who had seen a UFO in 1953 that resembled the craft that had taken him in 1985. He then contacted Bud Hopkins, who claimed to have had an encounter with extraterrestrials. Upon speaking with Hopkins, Strieber realized that his experience with the visitors on December 26th was not his first interaction with them. In fact, he had been contacted by them as recently as October of that same year. This realization convinced Strieber that his experiences were real and that he had indeed been abducted by extraterrestrial beings. Strieber's interactions with the extraterrestrial beings he refers to as the visitors continued to intensify in the years after his alleged abduction. One particularly strange incident involved him engaging in a romantic encounter with an other otherworldly being. Later on, Strieber claims that he had a small piece of metal implanted in his ear by two mysterious entities, which left him with more questions than answers. Strieber also experienced a bizarre and disturbing event in the early hours of June 6, 1998, while staying at the Delta Chelsea Hotel in Toronto. He was abruptly awakened from his sleep by a loud knock at his door, only to find himself confronted by a mysterious entity once again. Strieber told the Huffington Post that, I got up to open the door, thinking it was the room service waiter. It was not. It was a man I describe as about five and a half feet tall, older looking, like someone in his 70s. He wore dark colored clothing, a turtleneck, and charcoal slacks. Strieber documented the appearance of the peculiar entity which stood motionless by the window for nearly an hour. The being allegedly conveyed a cautionary message 
about the dangers of creating a more advanced intelligence than humans. And when Strieber inquired about the ethics of such technology, the entity reportedly responded. An intelligent machine will always seek to redesign itself to become more intelligent, for it quickly sees that its intelligence is its means of survival. At some point, it will become intelligent enough to notice that it is not self-aware. If you create a machine as intelligent as yourselves, it will end up by being more intelligent. According to Strieber, his encounter with the stranger was the most remarkable conversation he had ever had in his life. Strieber's publication of Communion propelled him to the forefront of alien abduction research for some and made him a household name. Despite his own uncertainty about the true nature of his experiences, Strieber became a representative figure of the phenomenon, drawing considerable attention and interest. The book's release ignited a surge of public curiosity in the subject of extraterrestrial interactions, and Strieber was soon flooded with letters from readers detailing their own encounters with the unexplained. He related to the Texas Monthly, My first books were unfortunate in one respect, in that they were so vividly written that readers and the media looked at them as descriptions of experience rather than descriptions of perception. There's a great deal of difference between the two. Strieber's alleged abduction by extraterrestrial beings was adapted into a feature film titled Communion in 1989, starring Christopher Walken. The movie follows Strieber's character as he comes to terms with the trauma of being taken aboard an alien spacecraft and subjected to strange experiments. Directed by Philip Mora, the film received mixed reviews upon its release, with some commending Walken's performance and the eerie ambiance, while others criticizing its slow pace and reliance on Strieber's disputed assertions. Nonetheless, Communion is a captivating portrayal of one man's encounter with the unexplained. Mr. Dornberger, in your own words, would you please relate what happened last night? Well, I was, I am a salesman, and I drive a truck, and last night, uh, shortly after 7 o'clock, I was coming from Marietta, Ohio, coming down Interstate 77, and just before I came to the intersection of uh, Route 47, there was a car past me, overtaking me from behind, and following closely behind this car was this unidentified flying object and as the car ahead or the car behind passed me this object was following close behind it and it swerved directly in front of my truck turning crosswise and when it turned crosswise it slowed down it started slowing not abruptly or too fast but it gave me plenty of time to step on my brakes and slow down with it but it forced me to come to a complete stop as soon as I had stopped, there was a door opened in the side of this vehicle, and this man stepped out and came directly to me, or came to the truck. He walked to the right-hand side of the truck, and he told me. On a chilly fall night in West Virginia in 1966, Woodrow Derenberger, a sewing machine salesman, was driving back from a business trip when he encountered what he believed to be a spacecraft shaped like a kerosene lamp chimney with lights. He soon met an entity which had a large grin and communicated with him telepathically, introducing himself as cold and assuring Derenberger that he meant no harm. Derenberger reported the encounter to the Parkersbridge police and it was later covered by the media. Other witnesses came forward with similar claims, and the encounter became known as the Indrid Cold Case. Was Derenberger a charlatan, insane, or did he really meet an emissary from Lanulos, as he claimed? In 1945, John A. Keel wrote his initial article on unidentified flying objects. 
However, it wasn't until his trip to the Aswan Dam in Upper Egypt in 1954 that he witnessed his first authentic flying saucer. Keel contributed to various national publications, and his bylined newspaper features were syndicated by the North American Newspaper Alliance, featured in more than 150 significant newspapers across the United States and internationally. He authored many articles on UFOs and conducted personal research on the subject, earning him a UFOlogist of the Year plaque at the 1967 Convention of Scientific UFOlogists. The movie based on his book, The Mothman Prophecies, premiered in theaters on January 25, 2002, starring Richard Gere and Laura Linney, and directed by Mark Pellington. The film was initially met with critical and commercial disappointment. However, in recent years, it has gained a following among horror enthusiasts who appreciate its genuinely disturbing and psychological horror elements. The movie tells the story of Gear's character, John Klein, a reporter whose wife witnessed a red-eyed, moth-like creature shortly before succumbing to a brain tumor. Two years later, Klein finds himself in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, where similar sightings of the creature have been reported. As he becomes embroiled in this enigma, he struggles to cope with his lingering grief, and his grips on reality begin to unravel. The film creates a tense and unsettling atmosphere, and it includes an unusual product placement moment when a demon-like alien voice on the phone tells Klein that it knows he's using chapstick lip balm. While engaging and well-written, the film diverges significantly from Keel's book in that the Mothman sightings actually take up a relatively small portion, the substantial amount being devoted to strange sightings of men in black, other odd encounters, both centered around the Silver Bridge tragedy and Keel himself. The Indrid Cold encounter, also known as the Grinning Man encounter, is closely related to the Mothman sightings and is often seen as part of the same larger paranormal phenomenon that took place in the area. That story really begins in November 1966 when two young boys, James Yeshidis and Marvin Monroe, were walking in the vicinity of an abandoned power plant in New Jersey. The boys reported seeing a strange figure standing by the fence, which they described as a tall, bald man with a luminous, greenish-gray skin and slanted, wide-set eyes. The man was grinning and staring at them intently, and they both felt a sense of intense fear. The boys quickly ran away, but the figure appeared to follow them, often appearing at a distance whenever they looked back. The figure, later dubbed the Grinning Man, was also reportedly seen by several other witnesses in the area around the same time. In part two of this study, we will delve into the Mothman sighting, the bizarre interactions with men in black, the collapse of the Silver Bridge across the Ohio River in 1967, as well as Keel's own opinions regarding his decades of research into these topics. As Keel stated in the Mothman prophecies, I am no longer particularly interested in the manifestations of the phenomenon. I am pursuing the source of the phenomenon itself. To do this, I have objectively divorced myself from all the popular frames of reference. I am not concerned with beliefs, but with the cosmic mechanism which has generated and perpetuated those beliefs. Well, it seems that the rain has abated for now, and the road should be safe to travel. 
If you must go, please promise to visit us again soon. Stay in touch with us for frequent updates, more real tales of the supernatural and horrifying, and the chance for you, dear listener, to possibly own a piece of paranormal history. Till we meet again, we will save you a seat in the haunted chair.